I'd like to introduce Umesh Dangat. Um, he is the core. Of the, he leads the core search team at Yelp. Um, during this time, he's been instrumental in modernizing Yelp's surf search infrastructure and moving from a custom distributed Lucene ranking application to a more general ranking application built on top of Elasticsearch. He wrote a custom geocoder for Yelp to help mitigate the reliance on third party and now serves the majority of the geocoding traffic at Yelp. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Liz. All right, so in this talk, I hope to shed some light on the search infrastructure that powers most of Yelp search, and in particular, its uh, relationship with the Learning to Rank Elasticsearch plugin. This should also serve as a disclaimer, which states I am mostly a search infrastructure fellow and not a search relevance guy, so if I misuse some of the relevance terms, please forgive me. <laughs> cool. Before we dive in, a quick uh, note on our mission, Yelp's mission, connecting people with great local businesses. All right, so let's take a look at some of the numbers that we deal with. Uh, the slides, okay, this is really huge here on the screen. I'm looking here, um, so sorry about that. This should help us give us an idea um, of the magnitude or the scale that Yelp deals with. While we're not as big as, let's say, Google or Facebook, we've gone past like the initial early startup phase, so where we are kind of a mid-sized company now. So some of our problems may or may not relate well to, let's say, a startup or even bigger companies like Google. So as of uh, last year end, we had over 177 million reviews, uh, all of which are searchable. And the monthly average of unique visitors <coughs> was over 100 million users. What this roughly equates to in the search land is billions of queries served in a year. During this talk, when I say Yelp search or Yelp core search, I'm specifically referring to you to the Yelp search box where you type in free text in this box here and you may or may not type in a location here. So these are the basic inputs for our search, the text um, and the location. Now, there are other kinds of searches that happen in Yelp. For example, you could think of the sponsored results, AKA ads. They also need to, that's a different team, but they also need to do some searching. Um, one of the newer teams like request to quote or message the business. If you have ever tried searching for things like plumbers and you request a quote from the plumbers, then you might see that Yelp shows, hey, more like these. Do you want to also send your code to these folks? That's also a search. Um, but the Yelp core search team has been the oldest at search. Um, and what's been happening lately, we have these other offsprings, other teams coming along and doing their own thing. Um, but hopefully in this talk, I can um, show you how we're trying to move to a common platform, which we call the ranking platform, which will power most of these searches. All right, so the Yelp architecture is mostly based off microservices, uh, and these are REST-backed microservices in production, which have certain endpoints and APIs, um, and more importantly, important is uh, that they have a service level agreement, that's the term, acronym SLA. What this means is these are certain contracts or guarantees that a service provides. With respect to search, for all, so we have more than one service for search, right? It's a suite of services doing specific things. For all our services in search, the important contract is the latency on a per query basis. And this is in order of two digit milliseconds for the search time. Now, with respect to relevance, why this is important is, on the one hand, we have a dedicated team of search relevance engineers who are training the models offline, trying to make better, smarter decisions, which inadvertently generally ends up being computationally more expensive over a period of time, and your search tends to get slower, which then in turn could potentially drive your users away if your search is really slow. So it's a trade-off between how accurate we try to get our algorithms versus how quickly we can run them um, in uh, real time. And of course, we also have to weigh, uh, weigh in the dollar amount that we're ready to spend on the compute or the hardware. Uh, and what versus what the feature is actually giving us with respect to uh, uh, users. And the other thing uh, we have to be wary of is the indexing. Again, um, some of the features at the, uh, Yelp like delivery or reservations are 
more sensitive uh, with respect to time. The moment they're indexed, we need to be able to make them searchable. Some others, like reviews, might not like need to go through in seconds. So these are the two contracts or guarantees we need to keep in mind. All right. So this is going to be the basis of the core of our discussion from here on in. And this is how the search backend at Yelp looks like. A raw search query comes in. When I say raw search, we can go back to the picture I showed you a few slides ago. And you could think of it having basically at least two things, which is a, a raw text. For example, restaurants near me and a location, which could be San Francisco. Now, each cloud here is essentially a bunch of services potentially, but logically speaking, it does uh, its own um, job of functionality. So the search relevance brain here essentially takes in this raw query, and the very first thing it has to do is go to the query understanding piece, where the query understanding piece does the natural language processing, aka NLP, um, for, which is specifically customized for Yelp. So for example, for the query restaurants near me, the query understanding piece could say, oh, the restaurants piece is actually a token which is specifically a category for Yelp, and it's, it's of important value. It's even more value now because Yelp has categories. Like, for example, restaurants is a separate category from plumbers, so it will send back the response saying, "Okay, I can annotate your text. Restaurants is um, the category, whatever, with some integer number, and the text near me is actually a location annotation." So now, when Relevance knows this piece, it sends this information across to the classifier. Uh, the query classifier. So the basic functionality here is, OK, is there any potential model we could run? So at Yelp, we have more than one model just for search. Because like I said, there is very different uh, ways the models are trained offline. Um, and each one has their own custom um, features uh, and stuff. So the query, the query classifier will classify the query to be a particular model. So at this point, we know two important pieces of information with respect to what is to be sent to Elasticsearch. One is the filter part, which means, uh, in this case, was near me, so the, a location box, which qualifies a document as a binary. Either a document is a part of the search recall or it is not. And the other part is the model, which helps us score or rank the documents that are actually pulled out, which essentially tells us how well does a document match the search. Now, we ship all this information uh, morphed as an ES query to Elasticsearch. Now again at Yelp, we don't just simply use vanilla Elasticsearch clusters. When you power up an Elasticsearch cluster at Yelp, you're bound to get Elasticsearch um, in a Yelp-specific way. Um, most of these are deployed as plugins, the most important one being the Yelp custom scoring. Now this is the guy who's going to essentially run your ranker or scorer and going to compute feature by feature. And we will talk about that more in the upcoming slides. But there are some others as well. Yelp does not rely on the Elasticsearch analyzers. So one thing to note here is the Yelp search has existed from before um, essentially Elasticsearch was there. So we have written our own analyzers for a variety of reasons, essentially, um, probably because it was a legacy. Uh, more importantly, though, is we support all kinds of internationalization. Um, and we also have our own uh, peculiarities in our tokenization process, like stemming or punctuations or synonyms, some Yelp specific synonyms. So we need to deploy our own analysis. And there are certain other rest points, uh, endpoints, like helper endpoints, to deploy some of this code. Um, for example, when we update a Yelp custom scoring, we need to deploy the new scoring slash jar on Elasticsearch via some endpoints. So this is the typical suite that we get uh, when you spin up an Elasticsearch cluster. Now, let's look at the Yelp custom scoring piece um, a little bit more in detail. Like I said before, um, the filter part is easy. It's left to Elasticsearch to tell us which document should be recalled. The scoring part um, is essentially based off a heuristic. Now, I think of these heuristics um, coming from two base categories. One is the document features. So with respect to Yelp core search, the document is a business. And the business attributes are the document features, which are a property of the business, like, is this business good for kids? Or what is the rating of this business? Uh, and so on. The other ones are query features. Now, these are interesting because they cannot be represented easily as a part of the business, because they're not really associated with the business. Although they do give you certain 
um, important features, for example, click-through rate. So for a layman, for me, uh, click-through rate is essentially, with respect to Yelp searches, if I search for dinner versus restaurants, then what's the click-through rate for this business when I search for restaurants versus dinner versus late-night food? So this kind of information, you can see it's a packed tuple. It's a list of tuple. Uh, we need to somehow represent this too. The other simpler query features could be time of day. Maybe we want to do certain different things based on time of week and time of day. And there's a bunch of features then which is built on top of this, uh, which we call as um, derived features. So I might use the terms base and derived features somewhat loosely from here on. A quick uh, word about ML and search scoring. Like I said before, um, I mostly work on the second bullet here, the online part. But what happens offline, I can give you a brief uh, overview. So once we have our model deployed online, we log essentially as much as we can. Um, you can think of the log as uh, an explain in Lucene or uh, even Elasticsearch. What are the things we can log which will help the uh, ML engineers offline to train on? So one important, like one concrete thing I can tell you is the feature score components or what does the attribute, what, how much did this particular feature attribute to the overall score? Um, and this is logged in an offline database. What happens there on is the ML engineers will iterate on this offline database and tweak their models or features and coefficients, um, generate a, a serialized format, and then the, the search infrastructure team is responsible for deploying this model online. Cool. Okay, this picture seems fine on the big screen. So before we used uh, learning to rank, the Yelp course search team used uh, mostly linear models in um, production for the most part. And I'm gonna try to walk through the arrows here and see if you can uh, follow along. So one important piece here is the biggest cloud here is the, the one where I write feature corpus superset. I, I don't know if this is a standard industry practice or we do it uh, just um, for uh, our use case, but when we train the model offline, it's a dense model in that it could have, it's a superset of all the possible features and the coefficients. But what happens at runtime is we essentially select a subset of these features. So you could think of every query being like a minified model of a feature of, uh, of a subset of features we have trained. So one concrete example could be um, CTR again. We potentially have different features for CTR, dinner, late night food, brunch. Now depending on the query, we might either select the brunch or dinner. So that's what happens when the query comes in the relevance piece. The feature set selector is responsible for selecting a subset out of these, and that's your base features. Then on top of those base features, we build some derived features. Like I said before, the derived features are some mathematical um, equations which basically build on top of the document and query-based features. Now together we have uh, all the features and the way to compute the model. So essentially we also have the model in the query. Um, and though we ship the whole thing over, and yes, that's true, we ship the whole thing over, which is the model with the features um, over as an ES query to Elasticsearch, which is where it's deserialized once per query, and then the Lucene scorer takes over from there for the ranking. If you see this little red thing here, the scoring data model.jar, that's the one, that's our API in a sense, or the data model, which is what is shared across the relevance piece and the Elasticsearch clusters. So this is how it used to work until very recently. So there are a few issues with this approach. As you can see, there is an API leak here because your scoring code is not contained on just Elasticsearch, or neither do we just have a relevance service or a, you know, a separate dedicated component which deals with figuring out the features and uh, making the, doing the ranking. So people joining the team, it's really hard to actually figure this stuff out and iterate on this uh, fast. And uh, more importantly, the other issue is code pushes. So like I keep saying, we have a different team for doing the relevance um, or training, and the team that maintains the databases like Elasticsearch, so we have 
tens of hundreds of nodes of Elasticsearch deployed online. So there are on-call engineers for this. So the way the Yelp model works is, if you push some code, there is going to be a build, Bamboo or Jenkins or whatever build pipeline. And if the build is broken, or let's say we push bad code, we need to be able to hit a button and say, okay, roll back. And you, so the on-call engineer can go back to sleep. But what happens here is sometimes we break that guarantee that I cannot always roll back code. One example is imagine you change, you add a feature. Now you push a scoring data model version bump on Elasticsearch. Then you push, then you make your appropriate code change on the client side, which is the search relevance. You make the version bump and you push code. Now let's say there are some other bug in the scoring data model current version. And it starts showing errors in the middle of the night. Page is an on-call engineer. I wake up, I say, okay, let me roll back this particular version. I can't do that because this guy is already sending those new features which are going to now fail. Um, right, so that's an issue. So we have to be aware of this uh, lockstep kind of push. Um, and more importantly, I think uh, one of the biggest issues was the next two, uh, I guess the second and the fourth point, which is it's difficult to extend for other types of models. So search ourselves wanted to go beyond like using linear models or whatever um, stuff we were doing with like having a subset of model for query. We wanted to extend to potentially use XGBoost or Anklips, um, and it's going to be a huge investment of uh, our engineering time to just do this in the current uh, environment. The last point speaks of kind of in a similar way in where other teams also want to do this outside of course search, like I mentioned, ads or uh, request to code or message the business, and their use cases were rather simple compared to ours, but we could not just say, hey, use our infrastructure, this is going to work for you, because it is not. And what happened with time was, as our queries got larger and larger and the model got larger, we ended up spending a lot of time on serialized, deserialized in Elasticsearch, which means we are throwing money at the problem for a while by saying, okay, let us just throw more nodes at ES so we can handle the compute cost. So at this point, we started looking for alternatives. So by looking for alternatives, what are some of the prereqs that we need to satisfy? The solution should scale for more than one specific team, like I said. We need to decouple model and feature training from online deployment. By this, what I mean is since we have different teams uh, with different responsibilities, it would be nice if one team is responsible for generating a true serialized form and giving me, and then there is no more code change needed online. Like I just mentioned before, we just deploy it via some rest endpoint and voila, it works. Um, it should also allow for iterations without Elasticsearch cluster restarts. We did achieve this before by essentially deploying our jar using some esoteric methods in Java to hot code reload the entire jar on the Elasticsearch cluster without having to restart our nodes. Um, this is not like a well known or like commonly managed practice in ES. But we had to do this because we potentially push the model several times a week. And our, like I said, our deployment was tens of hundreds of nodes of ES nodes. So we, we could not wait for days to restart the clusters. Uh, during the same time, some other developers were also looking at ho hosted model servers, which essentially means you get the data out of Elasticsearch, and then you don't have to deal with Elasticsearch in a way. You have all the data. You can decide if you want to do scoring um, there. But there are some issues with this in that if you do things like tiered scoring, so if you're doing the L1 or the first basic scoring in ES, but the L2 or the more expensive scoring outside, how do you deal with things like pagination? Or how do you deal with things like blending? which kind of are given to you by ES with the rescore query. So the alternatives needs to do most of these things. So our search led us to uh, the Elasticsearch Learning to Rank plugin developed by um, OSC. And at the first glance, um, it seems, this is, I've taken this from the homepage, the landing page of ES uh, LTR. At the first glance, it seems like, okay, they lock features, they store features in ES, which means we don't have to send those JSONs over. And oh, it does models more than linear, so it does actually boost. Cool. Um, how does it do specifically for our prereqs? We can use this across teams. Okay, cool. Can we decouple the offline and the online deployment? Maybe. And I'll come back to this later, uh, why this is a maybe. Should allow for iterations without ES restarts? This is yes for the most part, because we simply post the model. We, if you add a feature, 
we just uh, bump the model version or like up, uh, upload another model, and we could use both in production. Some cases, this is not true, but that is on our, our side. Imagine you had a feature which is inside a native plugin. Then you have to push a native plugin, and that's not up to LTR. Um, it's not a hosted server. It's doing stuff in the ES, so the point is not applicable, and it allows for TH scoring via rescoring. Cool. So we decided to pick one model, which is one of our more popular models, and deploy it or convert, try to convert it to using LTR. So how does the workflow now look like? So first, we begin with uh, uploading the features and the models via REST. Okay, this seems pretty straightforward. The nice part here is uh, if you have complex features like we did, most of the features could run in your own custom native plugin still, and LTR could essentially just be the delegator of things. Uh, so you, the work is still done, uh, the the work under the hood is still done by a plugin. But if you wanted to add qu quick features uh, or different teams, like I said before, want to have their own uh, new features, they don't need to write really custom plugins. They could write things like painless scripts or Lucene derived expressions, or uh, in the very basic form, just ES query. Um, then when now you see the relevant piece is much smaller here because it isn't doing much at this point. Uh, it still does the query understanding stuff and the classification but it doesn't need to build and understand the minified model. It simply passes the ES query with the filter section and the any query parameters needed, like time of day and stuff, to LTR, and then LTR will delegate the work to the other features wherever they are run. So we got the resonance model that we have uh, at Yelp, uh, working with uh, learning to rank, but it wasn't right off the bat. Like we could not take LTR and say, okay, this works. Um, we had to make a few changes to the existing uh, LTR plugin functionality. And uh, a couple of them are quite interesting, so I'm going to talk about them a little bit. So the first one is uh, selective feature selection. So consider you have a linear model with two features, like here, query and user rating. Typically, you have these coefficients, so whatever the score for title query is going to be multiplied by 0.3 plus user rating score point, uh, times 0.5. Now, we don't want that, right? Because like I said, we have minified models, like essentially a model per query, which is generated at runtime. So how do I do this in LTR? Mm -hmm. um, we had to add a feature called active features, where essentially you could pass in the features you really care about in this particular query. And that way, you eliminate the consideration of user rating in this case. Um, and that was, um, this is, yeah, that's, that's and this, this could be done uh, with the regular query itself. The other feature, which is uh, far more interesting and it took a lot longer, was passing a feature vector between LTR and the native Java plugins so that the features do not have to be recomputed. Now, what does this mean? So let's take a look at an example. Let's say you have one base feature called rating. Could be a document, a doc value lookup uh, in Lucene or Elastic search terms. Um, maybe a doc value lookup with some computation. But there could be other derived features using this in some other form. And this is a completely hypothetical feature here. Um, I don't think a thing exists like this for real, but just for the demonstration purposes. So if you see here, the rating itself is being used across features. Now. It would be nice if we already knew the rating score once and just reuse. The issue comes in where feature A and feature B are coming in from different uh, uh, plugins. So for example, if you go back to this slide, what if your feature A was here and B was a whole another custom plugin? The way Elasticsearch runs native plugins is it gives you its, your own class loader. So you have your own. Um, Class loader, which means you have your own uh, namespace for lookups. You can't really share uh, variables or classes across the boundary, and it would be really bad to have dependency on like different plugins. So how do you pass this? Fortunately, LTR does have the feature vector. What the feature? So if you go back here, remember LTR delegates the work. So what LTR maintains is an array of floats or doubles, which is a feature vector, which is the size of it is the feature set. So once you compute, some, compute something like rating, 
It's already there in the double. You can simply ask LTR, hey, can you give me the score for rating? And it's going to refer to that feature set, feature vector, without actually having to do it again and go to ES. And this is a big win for us because this saved us a ton of time on um, performance because we have tens of such fields, potentially like hundreds, I don't know. Um, and how does this look in practice? So let us consider this example again, where you have one base feature called title query, which is a simple match. And then you have another one, uh, which is called custom title query boost. So if you see, um, we added this uh, template language called script feature. It's not a mustache, that's the one difference. And the other, in this case, it's a painless, but it could very well be a native plugin. If you see the source in params, we didn't actually pass a feature vector, but we magically access it by saying params dot feature vector dot get title query. So what this implies is, is this going to go ask LTR and give you the score for the title query for that document? And then you can use that to do whatever you need to. Um, for that, you have to register your template language as script feature. And uh, LTR will make sure it magically gives you access to the feature vector. The one um, clue here is that the title query should have been already computed. Um, so what has to happen is when you post your features, like, I'd, like we do here, this one has to be posted first because it gets an index before this one. So essentially, this one is run before this one. That's the, all right. So where is LTR at Yelp today? So like I said, we managed to port over a few models of ours um, using LTR. And the nice part was we got rid of tons of custom code to do this and replace it with the generic uh, code base, which is mostly owned and managed by um, you know open source community. So that's nice. It allowed it to do uh, tiered scoring. So we went past just using the L1 or linear models in production. We also do use uh, XGBoost for some models now. And again, for using XGBoost, we didn't have to write code to do this. We could offload the work to LTR and use the inherent tree score query. Um, and the newer teams, like I said, are the teams that are trying to ramp up on ML and use models can now simply use LTR with uh, base query features, sorry, base uh, mustached based uh, ES queries uh, as the features of painless scripts. But there are still a few challenges. So going back to uh, one of the prereqs that I mentioned, how do we decouple model and feature training from the online deployment? So like I said before, at Yelp, there's a whole different team of engineers who are working on applied ML or core ML, training their data sets or models on, let's say, in Spark, on Redshift, or some other databases, which is not Elasticsearch. Then they come up with a model, and then we deploy it online in Elasticsearch. So if you see there's this gap, they might not necessarily know the logistics of Elasticsearch. So LTR kind of would enforce them to know, OK, write your query as an ES query here, versus this feature makes sense to go as a Lucene derived expression. And we would hear back, like, what is a Lucene derived expression? Um, you know. So what we ended up doing is writing a converter tool in the middle where we agree on a generalized JSON format that they would give us. And then our team or the ranking platform team is responsible for converting this into the most efficient um, ES-backed feature, ES-LTR-backed feature, whether it's a painless script or a, um, like a simple ES query. But that's still in works. Uh, we, we do this for a few models. And there are certain other problems to solve, like uh, there has been asked for neural networks. Uh, and I see there is some uh, already some uh, PRs around uh, solar for this. Uh, it's probably already used by some of you. I don't know. But we I haven't really seen it used in uh, ES. And the other thing is vector embeddings. This is becoming popular. I was speaking to uh, Maya from Elastic bef just before the uh, before my talk. And she has some. Uh, she has a talk tomorrow on the sparse and dense vectors. So that would be interesting as to how we can solve the similarity problem and use LTR with that in ES. Finally, I would like to thank uh, Doug for being accessible to answer all our questions because we we I randomly like just um, found the code like the code base and I pinged him on Slack and I said, hey, like the Yelp wants to use this and. <laughs> What do you think? And so it, uh, I'm glad it worked out well for us. And also for D. Kose, or some of you might know, know him as Nomoa. Uh, he's, uh, I think, based in Europe for doing all the code reviews. So yeah, thanks to both of you. And finally, uh, yeah, Yelp's hiring, <laughs> not just for the stuff I mentioned, but 
we are hiring overall like for any team you want to join in the back end front end ml um, yeah you can check out the careers page if you're interested in some of the other stuff that Yelp has been up to, you can look at the um, engineering blog. Uh, if you want to read up on how Yelp search was ported over from Lucene to Elasticsearch and how we did the, some of the cool uh, hard code loading in Java, that's there on the blog too. Uh, and we also have a GitHub page. And I think that's it. Any questions? Hey, great talk, Umash. I uh, have two questions uh, regarding the learning to rank plugin. Mm -hmm. The first one is about logging. Uh, we were thinking about using that feature, but we didn't end up um, implementing it. I was wondering, how much latency do you, th do you see when you log features alongside when you're serving queries uh, to users? And, and so that's part one. Part mm -hmm. two is, like, if you have features that currently unlocked and the data scientists maybe they come up with a new feature later. Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of backfill your new features into, into your historical search logs? Do you have any mechanism to do that? All right, so, okay, first question. Uh, the latency introduced by logs, cool. So what we were doing before, before we used LTR, also we were logging uh, because we were essentially providing the same functionality. What we do do is, so when you log, we would do, uh, I don't know if you're aware with like the fetch subface in Elastic. Mm -hmm. What happens is after you have getting the first recall or the first uh, top K documents, you rescore only those that you have asked for. So let's say you initially rank all the documents, and but your query says give me the top hundred. We're going to rescore or uh, you know r r in this case log just the top hundred. So it's not that much. Okay. So that way we didn't see any latency issues because a we were already doing this before. And it's only done on a subset of the initial ones that we actually rank a log. Uh, could you repeat a second question? I forgot. Uh, second Sorry. question is when you're logging uh, LTR features, sometimes you could have new features coming in that you currently that currently wasn't in your logging infrastructure. So, are, how are you backfilling those new features into your search logs? How are we back? So, just this is just respect to the logs. Okay, not the actual feature rollout. Uh, no, I was saying. Are, so I, 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 sorry. Go ahead. If you're, use, if you're logging the feature values, I'm, I'm supposing that you will use, then the data science will then use that to train machine learning models. Correct. Right, but what if they come up with some new features that mm -hmm. are currently not included in the logs? Mm -hmm. Like what's your sort of inf infrastructure around All right, uh, so backfilling those? Yeah, so our infrastructure around logging, like I said, is out of Elasticsearch. So once the query returns we, the response, uh, which has a log section, score components, we put it in, uh, we use Scribe for logging. So it goes to Scribe. And once it's in the log files in Scribe, it automatically goes to an offline database, which uh, where, I mean, there you could store it as a schematize, you know, or if so we have a schema for this. Yep. So it potentially changes the schema and then it ends up in a database. Once it's in a database, people can then uh, run queries against them. If it's an RDBMS, uh, like maybe like a Redshift, then you could do SQL queries. Okay, thank you. One, one last thing. I think you mentioned that you were only using a subset of your features at query time. I was wondering whether that's more of a computational concern or do you think using all the features is gonna overfit the search <laughs> experience? So I cannot answer definitively the second part, <laughs> um, but with respect to one of the reasons I can think of we did this was just by necessity. Uh, imagine having to ship the whole model over every time on every query here. Uh, okay. It wouldn't be feasible. Um, we have moved on from that we actually are trying to like pull up some of these uh, independent features into higher level features. So essentially it's the feature itself then decides whether it's, for example, dinner versus brunch. Um, but yeah, does that kind All of answer? Right. Okay. Great, thank you. Sorry, I took a lot of time. Anybody else? Thanks. Um, what are the next things you have planned 
with the plugin. Any any further advancements you want to take? What are you looking at in the future? There's an open PR for upgrade to Elasticsearch 7. I plan to push. I plan to like fix the issues pointed out by the reviewers after the talk, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> It's for the recording. It helps. Uh, can I pass it down? Hey, uh, so I, I hear that in Elasticsearch 7, one of the issues that's popped up is the no negative, uh, no negative score thing. How big of a hurdle is that going to be to the upgrade, and do you know how you're going to deal with it? So. Is the question how big of a hurdle is it for ES or LTR or for Yelp? <laughs> All three. Uh. ES, I guess it's already done, so it's not yeah. a hurdle for them anymore. <laughs> for LTR, uh, I, I issued a PR for ES7 for LTR. It's all there. Uh, so what I had to do was uh, some of the models like uh, Lambda Net, like uh, Lambda Mart, sorry, Lambda Mart were generating like negative uh, values. I had to just change them to like be positive. And I'm still in discussion with uh, Doug and uh, Nomoa as to whether we should do something in LTR to offset the value to be positive, or do we push this change on the uh, all the way to the user and ask the user to, you know, say, hey, can we can only generate like uh, values that are positive or throw an exception. So that's TBD in a way. Uh, for Yelp, yes, it's a big issue <laughs> because, like I said, the language spoken by some of the relevance folks is not yes. So it's not going to be easy for me as a search infrastructure engineer to go and tell like a department of 40, 50 people, hey, stop like generating models with negative scores. Um, so that's going to be a tough ask. So let's see what happens. I don't know. It's probably going to be a mix of try to not generate, but if we do, then maybe we handle it in LTR or in one of our plugins um, where we s try to like boost it up. Because the issue is, the obvious answer is, why not just say plus 100 or whatever? What was the base? Ba absolute like minimum value possible, bump by that. But the issue for Yelp is that only works if it's um, definite bounded value. But what if you're doing things like word score multiplied by minus 0.5? Now, you don't know what the word score is going to be, especially if you do a word score like we do, which is customized. It's, yeah, it's hard. Thanks. Any more questions? Quick question. So we know like Elastic is not friendly with custom plugins, putting your own plugins, query parsers, right? Mm -hmm. Custom handlers like Solar. So do you have any difficulty or do you guys made a deal with uh, Elastic so that uh, all your changes are approved? Oh, so we don't have any deal with Elastic. Uh, and these plugins are developed by us in-house, yeah. mostly. We do use some open source plugins, uh, but every time there's an upgrade, uh, for ES, yes, it's a big task for us to like now make sure all our plugins work. Uh, same thing with LTR or any other plugin. Um, yeah. Is there any uh, documentation on your side? Like, how did you develop these custom plugins? That would have yeah, so some of it is there in the blog post. So I have written a blog post on how we moved from, like I said before, we were on a Lucene uh, based yes. architecture before, and then we moved to Elasticsearch a couple of years ago. So some of this stuff, the details in this, are on the blog post. So if you look up at like uh, engineering blogs, Yelp, uh, or Elasticsearch, you should see okay. some details there. It. Thank you. OK, anybody else? Well, thank you, then. Thank you.